Next speaker is uh, Raj Lade. He is from uh, NCBS and he's going to tell us about mouse and the small dog. So I'd like to thank uh, Janaki and Amitabha for fantastic hospitality. I got to my room last night and found a set of biscuits on the side of the, on the, side of the bed, which I'm looking forward to eating with my tea. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, we had some fantastic talks. Uh, so earlier, uh, Lolitka and uh, Subramanian talked about the conservation of developmental processes uh, in all, almost all animals. Um, which is true. So all animals have, have fairly well conserved developmental processes. Um, we heard from uh, Sri Laja and uh, Janaki just now that the powers of the power of uh, the fish and the chick can be used to ask lot, very directed questions at the in the development of the of the vertebrates as well. And so why why do we use mouse? And so the mouse unlike the chick, which is the tastiest of the model organisms. The mouse can probably be called the cutest of the model organisms, They're little balls of fur, very cute. Um, and so, chicken can be cute. Not very, not very. <laughs> um, the, but the, the mouse has many things going against it as a model system. Uh, and so, one of the main uh, reasons uh, it's not a good system for developmental biology is that the embryos, the embryos develop inside the mother. And so to have access to the embryos, you have to sacrifice the mother to get the embryos out. Um, that's a huge disadvantage. Uh, they're relatively expensive to house, uh, and especially in modern animal facilities, you need specific pathogen-free conditions to house your mice. And so a mouse facility is quite expensive as well. But the main advantage of mouse is phylogeny. Phylogeny, phylogeny, phylogeny. Um, and so here I'm putting up the, the, the tree of life, okay? The, the phylogenetic tree. Um, and you can see here that there was a big split between protostomes and deuterostomes, where deuterostomes, uh, that happened almost three quarters of a billion years ago. And so in that time, uh, C. elegans and Drosophila have had time to independently evolve. And so still, despite this, despite this uh, divergence of three quarters of a billion years, um, developmental processes are still conserved, which is amazing. Um, but still, uh, still there is this divergence. And then when we think about fish and, and chick, um, the divergence that led to the lineage that leads to mammals happened about two, 250 million years ago. And so when we're thinking about, um, when we're thinking about disease systems, when we're thinking about something that is becoming closer to humans, it's important to start thinking about mouse as well. Mouse is the, uh, the predominant mammalian system. Um, this is a, the phylogeny of mammals. And you can see mouse here is part of the rodent family. It's still not so close to humans. Um, the split, the last common ancestor of humans and mice lived about 85 million years ago. But still, mouse is the, the, uh, the preeminent model system when we're trying to think about humans, human development, human disease. Um, I, this morning we were talking a little bit about um, Indian history and Indian culture. And I just want to bring up one thing about how mammalian embryology has a deep-rooted tradition in India as well. And so this is from the Garba Upanishad, uh, which, is, which is actually one of the first recorded embryological observations. And, um, and it's, uh, it's actually on human embryology. Um, I'll, you can read this independently. Um, these two paragraphs are very nice uh, observations. And then we, the last paragraph has less scientific observation and more guessing. Um, but 
So it's just suffice it to say that mammalian embryology has kind of a, a long tradition in, uh, in India. So why do we use mice? Uh, I've told you phylogenetic position. Mice are mammals. They're therefore close to humans. Um, while they may be expensive to house, they're easy to maintain. Um, they're rodents. They eat a lot, uh, but they're not fussy. Yeah, you can give them anything and they'll eat it. Um, as probably anyone who has a messy kitchen like I have uh, knows. <laughs> uh, they breed all year long, they're not seasonal. Um, and uh, they, they have a sh short generation time with a large progeny, uh, not as large as zebrafish, uh, <coughs> slightly larger than chickens. Yeah, so um, some strains you can get up to about eight or ten, ten uh, pups. <coughs> and they to tolerate inbreeding well. Okay, and this is an important point. Yeah, when I, I, in the next few slides I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the mouse as a research system. Um, and I'm going to try and elaborate this point about inbreeding. Inbreeding was important to generate particular linkage maps when the first mutations are trying to be mapped. So the position of the mouse in the mammals, uh, they're rodents. Uh, rodents are the most abundant of all the mammals. They represent 40% uh, of extant placental mammals. There's about 2,000 species in 28 different families of rodents. Uh, like I said, the last common ancestor of mice and humans lived about 75 million years ago, whereas the last common an ancestor of chimpanzees and humans lived between 4 and 13 million years ago. Okay? Um, so even though we use mouse as a model for, for humans, um, there are caveats, and so the, the people do need to be aware of that. Surprisingly, and I didn't know this until I was preparing for this lecture, mice, mus musculus, which is the species of mouse that we all use, have their evolutionary origin in the Indian subcontinent. And so they are supposedly uh, from this area, from uh, northern India and up into Pakistan. Okay? Historically, and as you can tell, mouse and mus musculus has now spread across across the globe, not just because of research, but because of trade and things like that. Uh, mouse has been bred for almost 3,000 years um, as, as a pet. Uh, albino mice were used as kind of a fortune, fortune telling devices by the Egyptian pharaohs. Um, there's a Greek temple to mice on the island of Tenodos um, that's older than the Trojan War. And so mice appear very historical in uh, in, uh, in, in culture, um, I found this picture of a mouse-shaped uh, wine jar, um, which was found in Crete, uh, and it's uh, from the third century before uh, BC, before Christ. They've been used as pets for millennia, and which goes back to the cuteness of the mouse. Okay. Um, so the research history of mouse, uh, mice, rats, and other small vertebrates have been used in research since the middle of the 16th century. William Harvey used mice on studies about reproduction and blood circulation. Robert Hooke used it to investigate the, um, the consequence of increased blood pressure. Priestley and Lavoisier used it for their studies on respiration. Um, what really drove mouse as a, as a model system for genetics, and that's where mouse uh, really does excel, is that during the 19th century, we got mouse fanciers. Um, mouse fanciers uh, dis realized that the inbreeding of mice brought about characters that they were quite interested in. And so they began exchanging and trading these uh, fancy mice with each other um, this, this kind of culture of inbreeding and uh, kind of uh, developing particular strains of mice that may have 
changes in coat, coat color or different patterns of behavior. Um, probably started in China, but Americans started doing it. Um, Europeans started doing it as well. And so uh, there were kind of these centers of trade of these kind of fancy mice. The two that, um, that probably are the most, uh, what's, the, what's the word? The two of them that are the most famous are changes in coat color and this waltzing behavior. So waltzing mice are mice that just move around in circles. Um, and uh, we now know that the reason they go around in circles is because proteins in their vestibular system, um, in their inner ear, have been mutated. Uh, and so they, can't, uh, they don't really feel uh, balance anymore. Intra interesting, another interesting fact, okay? I try, I don't, this is my last interesting fact, okay? <laughs> that um, Mendel's, Me so Subramanian brought up Mendel uh, earlier and talked about his, you know, everyone knows his classic uh, experiments on sweet peas. Mendel actually wanted to do his genetics experiments on mice and using coat color. Um, but the head abbot uh, protested. He didn't want some smelly creature uh, reproducing in, in, the, in the monk's room. Okay, so Mendel had to switch his sweet peas. In. I thought they're cute. The Mendel's, Mendel's boss didn't, okay? So the, the idea of mouse fanciers became, um, at the turn of the 19th century, became more and more um, stronger. And so probably the, and so a lot of this was kind of more, was crystallized in the US. And, uh, and in particular, uh, this, this lady, Miss Abby Lathrop, around 1900, began breeding and supplying these fancy mice, yeah? And she, she had a huge colony. Um, and even now, the, the common strains that we use, uh, the, black, the black C6 and um, things like that, derive from her original strains. Um, she, um, she also started doing some, some experiments um, with Leo Lobb. Um, she realized that some of these inbred strains were more, more prone to cancer. And so she started doing some initial experiments on, on cancer in, in Harvard, in the Bussey Institute in Harvard. So she was uh, supplying these guys, Castle and his uh, colleague, uh, Clarence C. Little. Um, and they're very important for kind of the early development of the mouse as a genetic resource. And so what Little began to do was to continue those inbreeding experiments to, do, to develop um, linkage maps. Um, and these are important. The linkage maps are very important. Um, and tools were then developed uh, for gene. And in the course of inbreeding, they realized that they were getting lots of spontaneous mutations. And these guys started uh, developing tools to aid in genotyping these, uh, these spontaneously occurring phenotypes. And that, so this is kind of a, just before the time that the, that the genome, that actually DNA was known to be, that DNA, DNA was known to be the hereditary material. And so genes and the correspondence of genes to DNA still wasn't known at this point. So, so this is the history of the mouse. Um, we're coming up to now about the 1960s. And what I want to talk about now is uh, what we can do with mouse, okay? And so you might have, what I've been trying to tell you so far is that the, the main uh, advantage of mouse is genetics, okay? The fact that you can do inbreeding, um, the fact that there have been spontaneous mutations that have arisen, and the fact that they are close to humans as well. Um, and so what I want to talk about for the, for the next uh, 10 minutes is the, the tools that we can use um, to kind of harness these powers, okay? Um, and so I'm going to talk about transgenic mice. I'm going to talk about knockout mice. I'm going to talk about mutagenesis screens. And I'm going to talk about what the future of uh, mouse genetic technology might be, okay? 
So the first, sorry, the first transgenic mouse was actually developed in 1974 by Rudy Janish. Um, and he injected uh, viral DNA into, uh, viral DNA into, uh, into an oocyte and found that some of the progeny were carrying um, the virus, uh, but they never, he could never make them go germline. Okay, so they, they weren't propagating. Propagation happened in the early 80s uh, through the experiments of Frank Ruddle, Frank Constantini and Elizabeth Lacey, Richard Parmenter and Ralph Brinster, um, all working in about 1980 to develop uh, proper transgenic mice. Okay, and what they did was something called pronuclear injections. Um, so what, what they did was to take um, fertilized eggs, microinject the eggs with DNA, take these eggs that had been microinjected, reimplant them back into the mother, and at birth, some of these offspring would have the DNA that, they, that they'd injected. They could then take, what was fantastic is that they could take those offspring and make them um, and find that this transgene was inherited. And that, that was very important. This is a pronuclear injection happening. Um, this is the ovum. Um, here, the injection pipette heading into the pronucleus, okay? So that's that. Um, what this technique is good for, there's many things, of course, that this technique is good for. Um, developmentally, what, uh, what this technique of pronuclear injections and making transgenic mice has, has allowed us to do is to map enhancers. And so as you all know, genes are controlled by enhancer elements that uh, dictate the expression, expression domains of, of that gene. And so what you can do is hook up a particular enhancer to a particular um, reporter and ask where it, where it ends up. In this figure, what they're trying to do is give the mouse prostate cancer. Um, I don't want to do that. Um, what I want to do is map, or what, we've, what we're interested in is mapping how the expression pattern of various genes are controlled. And uh, this, I like this, I work on inner ear. PAX2 is important for inner ear development. Um, I've always liked this paper because it, what they're doing is mapping um, the enhancer of PAX2. And one region where the PAX2, uh, PAX2 is control uh, is expressed is in the hindbrain here, okay? Um, and what they found is that in the enhancer of that controls the hindbrain expression, um, they found a PAX2 binding site and they've mutated this and found that this hindbrain expression is lost. So getting very nice mapping of enhancers like that. The, I want to go on to knockout technology now. So we, we all know that genes can be knocked out in mice. Um, what maybe you don't fully appreciate is kind of the, the confluence of technologies that needed to, de to be developed so that knockouts could be made. So knockout mice are where genes are removed from the mouse, from the mouse, okay? Uh, to do that, the following three things needed to have happened, okay? The development of ES cells, and so I think everyone is aware of what an embryonic stem cell is. Um, these are cells that can be cultured, uh, transfected, and selected, and that are able to give rise to any part of the embryo. We need DNA vectors that are necessary for homologous recombination to modify the mouse genome. And then you need to be able to introduce this modified ES cell back into the embryo uh, and allow it then to produce chimeras. All of these happened, okay? Probably the, the development of ES cell technology was the, was, um, the kickstart that was needed. And so ES cells, are basically cultured embryos, okay? And so what, what's happening here is um, 
The mouse embryo is isolated at this stage, at about three days. Um, the inner cell mass is um, uh, cultured uh, on a particular layer of feeder cells, and these can then be cultured indefinitely and remain pluripotent, okay? Um, they can be expanded, and what, more importantly, they can be transfected with, with, with plasmids. Um, they can be selected by a, by a cytotoxic agent, um, and so you can manipulate these in the same way you would manipulate any cell culture, okay? Homologous recombination is where um, you would get correspond, you would use the cell's uh, innate recombination ability. Oh, I have a pointer. I don't, know. don't have to come here. <laughs> so I kind of like to walk around, I guess. Um, you use the cell's, um, the cell's innate ability to do recombinations, uh, so my, meiotic recombinations, for example. And so here we have a gene, okay, gene X. Um, you're introducing a plasmid with uh, homologous regions to gene X, but it contains also neomycin resistance, okay? Now, you try and put that into the genome, okay? And this is all in the ES cell, so it's not in the embryo itself. Um, because you're selecting for neomycin, so neomycin is a cyt cyt cytotoxic agent, this gene encodes for a resistance to neomycin. Um, only the cells, that, the cells that grow will be the ones that are expressing neomycin, okay? These cells don't grow. So the ones that don't have neomycin in don't grow. Um, so in this way, you can get homologous recombination. And, if you, and in this way, you can start disrupting particular genes of interest, okay? Um, homologous recombination happens, uh, is about 1%, okay? So it doesn't happen very often. Um, so it corresponds to about a frequency of uh, about 10 to, the 10 to the minus 5, okay, when you consider the total number of ES cells transfected. So it's not particularly um, efficient, but it works, yeah, and most knockout mice have been made this way. What, um, and just a brief, how do, you get this, how do you get the DNA in there? You get it by, you get it in there usually by electroporation. Um, you, select for, you select for the particular uh, resistance cassette and then identify those ES cells. You pick clones at some point and identify those ES cells that contain the gene disruption. Once you have your selected ES cell, um, what, what you will do is uh, inject it into a blastocyst uh, of, a, of a donor embryo and derive chimeras. Now, it so happens that ES cells are generally made from a particular strain of mouse, uh, say an agouti mouse, uh, which is a brown mouse, and they get electroporated or they get injected into an albino mouse. And so you know that chimerisms happened because now the, the offspring will have patches of, patches of uh, brown, okay? Yeah, so that, that's a good sign of chimerism. This is what actual ESL blastocyst injections look like, okay? And so um, here's the blastocyst. This is the inner cell mass. And all you have to do is deposit a bunch of ES cells in the general vicinity and they'll get incorporated and they'll give rise to a mouse. I make it sound really easy, but it's really, really hard, okay, to do this. And everything's done under a microscope, okay? It's, a, it's, a, it's not as big as a chicken egg. <laughs> okay, so these uh, techniques can be modified a little bit. And so in the same way that um, uh, in flies, you have flip FRT to, to drive uh, lineage-specific expression. In mice, you have Crelox. Um, Crelox, um, to the explanation for Crelox, I'm going to refer you back to uh, Lolitka's talk, yeah, because that was an excellent explanation. Just substitute flip for Cre and FRT for Lox, and you're, you're there, okay? Um, so you can drive gene-specific expression in particular regions. You can knock out genes in particular regions as well. 
So if you have an enhancer that drives Cree in a particular region, um, and you have a, uh, a gene that's flanked by two LOXP sites, or, two, or something like that, you can knock out the gene in a particular region. And like, uh, like in flies, you have the P, in, P element enhancer trap lines, which are there to kind of derive more and more um, uh, enhancers controlling uh, flip in particular regions. In mice, you have also particular enhancer trap lines as well that are there to generate more and more crease. So this is one of those enhancer trap lines. It's, um, it was started by the Allen Brain Research Institute, and it's to develop Cree lines that are uh, targeting specific populations of neurons. Um, and uh, you, you should all probably check out this paper. Okay? I, I, I don't have really time to go into it in too much detail, but they're doing enhancer traps, uh, and what they're finding are a bunch of particular Cree lines that are, and here we're looking at the cortex, and these are all restricted to individual layers of the cortex or individual types of neurons uh, within the cortex of the mouse, okay? And so that technology is, is, is there. And so in the last two minutes, I'll, just because I'll finish these slides quickly, we'll talk about mutagenesis. Um, in the same way flies have... Um, Mutagenic screens. Mice have also had mutagenic screens. Catherine Anderson has developed uh, this strategy very nicely. Um, and what she's found, um, the findings that have come from her lab. Um, and so I should say that the identification of genes is not so, I think all the genes that need to be identified have been identified in flies and fish. Okay. Mice aren't, aren't mice. These ENU mutagenesis screens don't identify many more genes. Okay, what they do identify is particular ways that genes are organised. Okay, um, and so, so what Catherine has done is to look at um, the patterning of the neural tube. Okay, is, is her is her readout whether the neural tube closes or whether it's patterned properly. Um, what she was looking for. Is, is just neural tube patterning, but what she found was an insight into the way sonic hedgehog was signaling. A sonic hedgehog, you heard earlier, um, is important in the, in the fly, of course. Uh, it's important in the, in the vertebrates as well, in limb patterning. And one of these genes that came out of the ENU screen was this uh, mouse KIF7. KIF7 is localized to cilia uh, and nowhere else, and using this Using this information, combining all of this information, what, uh, what is now pretty much canon in vertebrate development is that sonic hedgehog signals through these specialized structures in the cell called cilia, okay? And that's something that's come away from the ENU mutagenesis screens. Finally, I'm going to whiz through this. CRISPR-Cas is being developed in, in mouse. It's working very well. Um, combined with things like this ultra super ovulation technique. And I, I just needed, I just wanted to talk about this very briefly because all of these mice, all, all of these eggs, that all of these mice have come from eggs from one mother at one time, okay? And there's a, now a technique where you can um, use, this, uh, use this regime to super ovulate the mouse. It will she'll produce a lot of eggs, and those can be then manipulated in various ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they'll be transplanted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Janaki, as a mother, you're there going. <laughs> so normally what limits the brood size? So just the, so the biggest brood size, the biggest litter size you can get is about 16 embryos. And it, and in a 16, I think it's just, I think it's the number of eggs that are released in every well, cycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not the entire No. Um, so you have various techniques, cloning-free CRISPR-Cas9. So if you combine this superovulation technique with this cloning-free CRISPR-Cas9 system, 
or even perhaps oocyte electroporation to introduce plasmids into oocytes, then we, we can get to somewhere like kind of mass producing many, many knockout mice or genetically modified mice. Um, this has been done. This has been done all over the world. Um, I'm going to draw your attention to the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, uh, which generates uh, and publishes many mice um, that are accessible and deliverable to, to your labs. Um, I won't go through how they're doing it, um, but I'm going to leave you with um, the resources that you can that you can do. And so this is the uh, Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, so please uh, check this out. Um, and all of these other resources are fantastic for mice, finding mice, uh, tapping into the pipelines that are being generated to make mice, um, and, uh, and things like that, okay? Um, and so that's it. Um, I'll, I'll leave you with, <laughs> with this, that my, my intern, I, my intern who's just left um, showed, put this, put this slide up, which is, you know, which is, a, which is very good. Uh, the mouse is the CV of a lifesaver. Um, and so despite being very cute, it's been responsible for all of these Nobel Prizes and all of these advances in, in, uh, in research. Okay. Thank you very much. How is a human age uh, like correlated in mice? Like a uh, 15 year person, what would be the age in mice? You know, I, I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I know for dogs. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know for mice. So mice, you generally have a lifespan of, of about two years, two and a half years, okay? Um, by, by a year and a half, they're showing, you know, signs of aging. Um, so, in, of course, it's strain specific. It's, it depends on the strain of mouse as well. But most, most mice, most mouse strains will start showing some sort of hearing loss by about a year and a half, 20 months or something like that, okay? 50 years old, okay. I still some years away from 50. I'd probably say about a one-year-old, 14-month-old mouse. <laughs> I'd, I'd put myself with a 14-year-old mouse, a 14-month-year-old mouse. Any other questions? Actually, what is done in super ovulation technique? What is you gave it some kind of yeah, and so it's a particular it's a particular regime of hormones. Yeah, so generally it's uh, CGH, but here it's CGH plus something else. Okay, um, you can you can talk to me afterwards. Yeah, I'll give you the reference for that paper. Okay, because it's it's a definite specific set of things. Okay. If there are no more questions, let's thank Raj. Let's conclude this session by thanking all the speakers for giving us the insights into the strengths of uh, different model organs. Thank you very much.